Hey out there, today is Monday, October 18th, 2021. Coming up on the show today, from the Netflix original series Sex Education, editor David Webb. It's true, there is always that terrifying moment on your first gig where you're going to think, someone's going to ask me if I've done this thing before. Editor Steve Aykroyd. We've got like five, six, seven needle drops per app, and they were just like, if it works, let's do it. And it really set a good tone for the show. Editor Phil Hignett. Editing is quite lonely because you're more or less on your own for quite a lot of the time. So working with other editors who are next door to you and you can chat about scenes or what's working or what's not is really helpful. And editor Isabella Curry. So I was cutting it thinking, oh my gosh, am I managing to make sex ed depressing? (laughs) Yes, all that and a lot more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Well, hi there. Come on in. Matt Fury here. I got a podcast for you. But you knew that, right? Yeah, no time to waste today. This one's action-packed. Lots of guests. One show, but lots of guests. The show is the Netflix original series Sex Education. Have you seen it? Chances are you have because the show is quite popular. In fact, it's one that I've had people write in about and request to have on the podcast, so I am thrilled that it is finally happening. But if you are not intimately familiar with the show, let me give you a wiki-like overview. Sex Education is a British teen comedy drama streaming television series, that's a lot of adjectives, created by Laurie Nunn for Netflix. The show follows the lives of the students, staff, and parents of the fictitious Moordale Secondary School as they contend with various personal dilemmas often related to sexual intimacy. Sex Education primarily follows Otis Milburn, a student at Moordale Secondary School. Otis begins the series ambivalent about sex, how about that, in part because his divorced mother Jean, played by Gillian Anderson, is a sex therapist. But over the course of the three seasons, Otis follows in his mother's footsteps and, along with his friend and sometimes love interest Maeve Wiley, becomes a sex therapist in his own right to the students at Moordale. The first season of Sex Ed was released in January of 2019, the second in January 2020, and then the third on September of 2021, so a little pandemic-related delay there. Being the hit that it is, the series has been renewed for a fourth season. Joining us today to discuss the editorial process of sex education are editors Steve Aykroyd, Phil Hignett, David Webb, and Isabella Curry. So we get a lot to talk about, a lot of talented people to speak with, and we will get right to it after a short discourse about our very sexy sponsors who are here to educate you on being a more productive media maker. First, let me school you on how you can have a big advantage with your next project, with our dear friends at Extreme Music. They provide superior production music crafted by multi-award winning artists, musicians, and composers. You know, music can work miracles for your story, and Extreme Music has got some of the biggest miracle workers in the business. Names like Ramin Jawadi, Michael Giacchino, and Ice-T. For over 20 years, content creators throughout the media industry have been turning to extreme music to get the very best in production audio. It's free to try, and you can find any type of track you need with a simple keyword search. You can get your tracks just the way you want them, right down to the stems. That's right, you can customize them for whatever you need. And once you find what you're looking for, they make it easy to license online or the representative from their many offices around this world of ours. So show your support for The Rough Cut and do yourself and your story a big favor by checking out ExtremeMusic.com. Someone else you need to know is our pals at Massive. They're the only name you need to know when it comes to cloud-based media moving. Massive is a robust file-sharing solution for the modern post-professional who's tired of data caps and shipping around bubble-wrapped hard drives. They offer a secure file transfer method that can move terabytes of data over the cloud. That's right, terabytes. Other cloud-based media moving companies put a cap on what you can send, and you don't want that when you're moving around those high-res media files back and forth. Plus, as a member of the Trusted Partner Network's roster of vendors, You can rest assured knowing that Massive is a proven service that protects against those heartbreaking data breaches. Hate those things. You don't need a subscription to sign up or some convoluted DIY homebrew server setup. You just pay as you go at 25 cents per gigabyte. A terrific deal. Followed up by another terrific deal, which is if you sign up for Massive today using massive.io slash the rough cut, the dash rough dash cut, you can get 100 gigabytes free towards your transfer. That's massive.io slash the rough cut for 100 gigabytes free. Once again, I'll put links in the show notes for both our benevolent benefactors. Okay, time to hit the classroom to learn a little sex education. Here are Steve, David, Izzy, and Phil. I can't hear you, Phil. Is it my internet connection or yours? Am I really quiet? I can hear Phil, like, really loud. It's like in a well. Oh, sure. Are you in a well? Yeah. (laughs) The thing is, there's nothing to give the scale of Phil there, because Phil's actually a really huge person, so he sounds a bit like that anyway. 
Sorry, I've got a bit of a crying baby. So you can't hear, can you, when I mute the mic? We can. You've got a mute button on your baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this show is something of a sleeper hit, pun intended, in that it doesn't seem to benefit from a lot of promotion in mainstream media, at least not that I'm aware of. But it is highly regarded by critics and it has a legion of fans, which I think speaks to just how great the show is and certainly the power of word of mouth. And while the show has grown in popularity, I think it was pretty popular right out of the gate. Steve and David, you guys were on from the very first season. So as a way of getting to know everyone and where they were in their careers when they joined the show, let's talk about how you each got on the show and what you'd been doing prior to that. So Steve, why don't you start us off? Well, I got on the show basically because I've been working with one of the directors, Ben Taylor, for quite a while. I've known him for, since we were doing music videos 20 odd years ago. In fact, I've known him since he was a runner and I was coming up in the industry. And we started doing some long form together a while back because I kind of come from a commercials world. But he was the first guy to give me a shot at long form. And that was when we did Catastrophe together. And then when it came around to doing sex eds, he kind of came in and said, would you like to do it? And he's always been a fan of Dave's and was like, you know, we've got this great show. And he's, he, he's not only directed it, but he's kind of show running it as well. He came up with a lot of the aesthetic and concept. and um, you know, he and Laurie, it was their baby, really. He was super excited about it. We were super excited about it. And, you know, we jumped on the chance to, to work on it. Well, I mean, who isn't a fan of Dave? So, so Dave, why don't you <laughs> tell us about you? So similar to Steve, really, I knew Ben since he was a director's assistant. We used to cut really bad boy band videos back in the 90s with a really lovely director that Ben used to assist. And Ben was like the tech it's like the tech dude, wasn't he? If there was, ever there was a complicated kind of post shoot, they'd always kind of chuck Ben in the suite and try and get him to work out the mechanics of how the heck it was going to work. It never did quite work out, but um, <laughs> Ben was always striving <laughs> to get it to work. And um, we kind of kept in and out of touch. And then he did Cardinal Burns, and I was watching it one night, which is like a comedy sketch show. And um, I noticed on the credits that he directed it, and I just messaged him out of the blue and said, congratulations on that and he mentioned that he was about to do catastrophe and then steve jumped on that with great success <laughs> i like hard birds that five years later ben gave me a call no but and then we just kept, <laughs> but he gave me a call and we were talking about where he was at and i was i can't remember i think i was doing wrong man's or something anyway i was doing something and and then we just kept in touch after that and then when sex ed came together he tried to assemble bunch of idiots that knew each other from days of yore and steve and i were top of that list really so he found his idiots well before we move <laughs> on to uh to phil and izzy i think that's a great bit of be careful how you treat people on the way up because you could be editing for them within five years so <laughs> okay phil you joined next i think in season two tell us about how you got on the show i did yeah mine's a really similar story actually worked with ben on a couple of commercials back in 2017, I want to say. I guess Steve and, and Dave were probably busy, which is why he didn't go with them. And uh, yeah, just hit it off. And uh, he asked me to do a pilot for a show he was about to do, I think before Sex Ed, called Year of the Rabbit. And that was only like 10 days work, I think, the pilot. That got picked up. And then Ben asked me to do the first series of Sex Ed, but because I hadn't done anything long form, I think Netflix said no. Well, that's the story he told me anyway. So, <laughs> Brilliant. Which was fair. Like, I, would, I wouldn't say yes to me. Like, who the hell would say yes to that? So, yeah. And you the rabbit was with Channel 4 and they didn't care. Yeah, they didn't care. <laughs> I did the pilot. It's true. There is always that terrifying moment on your first gig where you're going to think, someone's going to ask me if I've done this thing before. <laughs> yeah. Imposter syndrome. Completely, but you really are an imposter, so why the heck yeah. wouldn't I ask it? <laughs> so it's, that's the level, isn't it? It's from commercials to a pilot, and then from the pilot to the series, and then from there it's, yeah, I'm on to sex ed. So Izzy, yeah. last but not least, and being the last one in, you should have known better. I mean, <laughs> just no matter, tell me about uh, joining sex ed and what you were up to before that. I actually didn't get to meet them before I joined, so um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I came up through the assistance route, uh, much like Rob has done. So I worked um, as a runner and then worked my way up. Um, well, actually, I worked in ads initially and then moved across to long form at an earlier stage. 
and I worked my way up assisting on some bigger shows and trying to break into becoming an editor on long form and then eventually I got after doing lots of short films I got a gig on I Hate Susie and I edited that and then I guess as a result of that Rignaro who was the director of the second block this season got in contact and see if I wanted to join Sex Ed for an episode because I think there was a spare episode going so yeah that's how I got on. Obviously with any series getting it off on the right foot very important so, Steve, I thought we'd talk a little bit about establishing the look and the feel of the pilot and working with Laurie and Ben to make sure that you figured out what sex education needed to be before you got underway. I mean, they approached it with a, a very definite kind of style that they wanted to to use. There was a, uh, a sense of nostalgia towards the old John Hughes teen movies. They didn't want to necessarily make it localized to Britain. They wanted to give it a bit more of a scope. So that's why it has such an ambiguous setting. Because although it's shot in Wales, it feels like it could be United States or virtually anywhere. And then you look at the aesthetic, every single car, the dress, it feels 80s. And then suddenly a mobile phone will pop out and you're like, oh, hold on, I'm confused. But the confusion was on purpose. It was to just keep it a bit more universal, a bit more ambiguous so that you can set it at any time. But when Ben, ben came and was selling it to us as an idea, he was like, you just want to make it really great and music was one of the major parts of that he said you know we want it to be very musically led to have a strong push that way and if you look at the way it's structured it's not regular as in like a drama there's a lot of set pieces in that seem to be constructed around an idea a lot of the time so you've got Laurie's great scripts which have a, a very strong through line character development story arcs and then you've got Ben approaching every single scene as a unique entity. So for us, it's great because every time you get a day's worth of rushes and you're cutting a couple of scenes, it's like, you know, what do we do with this? You know, it's very much open. And the guys are really up for us picking things like the music and the style and stuff. And we just try it out and then try and sell it to people. That's good, Stephen, too, when you're doing the assemblies. You know, you always kind of keep your head above water and then you find there's a big set piece or not even a big set piece, like a 90 second set piece given that there's probably about seven or eight minutes to assemble every day when they're shooting and you get so tied into doing one set piece that you set yourself back for the whole week because you're just kind of, you know, attending to that thing, which is, I don't know, that's what, that's what we all enjoy though, isn't it? Yeah. Those are the pieces we love to get our teeth into. I think that's one of the reasons why we were hired, the ex-commercials editors and music video editors. So easy. They realized that that wasn't the way they wanted to go by series three. (laughs) But, you know, that concept of, hey, let's do a a music piece now and cut it really fast and make it really exciting and, you know, treat it like a music video. Mm. That's what we love doing. And there was a lot of that being given to us. I noticed that. The weird thing about it, though, is it's like doing a bunch of little music videos, but you don't have the music track to cut to because you've got to find that thing as well. So... It's like, here's a little 90-second music video, but we, have, we don't know what the track is yet. Yeah, but it's so much better than me giving a load of boy <laughs> band tracks that you've got to cut to for a week, isn't it? True, yeah. I have to say, coming in on the second series, I don't know what it's like for you, Izzy, but to have Steve and Dave's sort of musical taste and obviously, yeah, everyone involved in the show to live up to was quite a, a tricky task. Mm. It was sort of the tracks they chose and everyone chose was pretty spectacular. So yeah, I agree. to sort of try and live up to that was quite tricky, but hopefully successful. Yeah, I found a couple of times I went to look for a track and then I found it already had been used in the previous seasons and I was... You know, it's just like there's such an aesthetic to all the music you chose and trying to find those belters and not repeat was tricky. <laughs> that was the, one of the amazing things about the show. The production company and Netflix were really behind making sure that there was a decent music budget and that we could really go for it. We've got like five, six, seven needle drops per app and they were just like, go with it. If it works, let's do it. And it really set a good tone for the show because it's exciting, you know. Well, what was pretty horrifying for us in season one, though, was the realisation of how expensive some of these tracks were going to be. Because obviously mm-hmm. when you're an editor, you're just selecting tracks you think are going to be great for the scene. You, there's no consideration of licensing or budget or whether you can get approval for these things. 
And our music supervisor was, you know, having heart attacks every other day with the stuff that we were chucking his direction. But it was almost like a measure of success. If it gave Matt a little heart attack, then that's the one that we should go for in it. <laughs> <laughs> and what we were finding a lot of the time was, you know, because you've got that privileged position as an editor to be the first person to put the track on it with the footage and you're seeing it and feeling it, you whack a track on and you're like, okay, it might be a very expensive track, but I feel this track for this piece. Mm. You put it on. Sales through, everybody loves it, but then somebody turns around and goes, actually, guys, you know, it's destroying the budget. Can we try some other ones? But what often happens, more than often, was that people would just come back and go, actually, fuck it. Let's go with that original one. That still is the best. And we just had a really good team that were willing to fork out for it, I guess. I mean, it was interesting. Matt, our music supervisor, said there's like a billboard chart in the States which kind of tracks what people download based on what they're watching. And we'd never heard of this before. On the launch of Sex Ed, I think in the, in the first week, we, we had like seven out of the top ten tracks worldwide that were being downloaded, which were based on watching the show. Only seven? Come on. Well, actually, I'm being, I'm being modest because actually I think it was <laughs> nine, but I don't want to be misquoted. <laughs> <laughs> so 10, 10 out of 10, mate. Generally, editors fall into one of two camps when it comes to the needle drops. Some like to get those in right away and sort of use them as inspiration. Others don't like to have them in there early on because they want to be led by the music. How do the four of you sort of fall on that? I think it's impossible to cut certain scenes without attempting music, even if you end up ditching it multiple times. You know, you should never get so attached to a music track that you can't chuck it out because... Things get chucked out all the time. Mm. But when something's as a set piece to music, to cut it mute or to cut it dry, for me, is just the wrong way to go. It helps with the rhythm a lot, just cutting it to something. Yeah, I mean, it depends what the thing is. You know, if it's a dialogue piece, absolutely cut it dry, cut it dialogue and cut it without any kind of dressing. But mostly they're kind of action or kind of physical pieces or, or MOS scenes that are cut with music tracks in the show. The needle drop ones anyway so it helps i find it helps anyway i'm the opposite i think actually i i think the sort of the pictures need to tell the story and then you find a track that sort of works with that and you can sort of manipulate the pictures if you need to to hit certain beats or whatever but yeah for me it's picture first so phil and izzy when you're joining a show that's already in progress established beloved by fans what's the process for getting to know everyone, for being onboarded, for being integrated? Who do you talk to? What questions do you ask? What's the process for getting in there and joining the team? That's a good question. So we cut this in a place called Final Cut. Nothing to do with Final Cut software either, because all of us hate that. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me, okay, I can work that in. Take three. Take three. So when I joined on Series 2, um, I was very welcomed by the returning editors, David no, Steve. take four. <laughs> <laughs> That's really sweet. Because you're still not welcome, Phil. Izzy, on the other hand. Is, Izzy, how are you onboarded? Well, I guess, yeah, it was a very welcoming environment at Final Cut. And I was working from home for a bit of the assembly. So, you know, with everything, it was a bit of a slow start but once we got into the fine cut it was really nice to be all working in the same area and you can ask the guys about music and I was a massive fan of the show I mean still a massive fan of the show um so yeah it's quite daunting to come on in the third season and hope you're going to do as good a job as these guys did like Phil said with the tracks but with everything and kind of wanting to um you know it's it's a creative show so you can they're kind of open to letting you try stuff, but also you want to keep it, keep it in the kind of sex ed world, of course. So, yeah, a bit daunting, but they were welcoming. Can I answer? Can I do a take five? <laughs> Your second or third one were good. I'll pick from one of them. <laughs> <laughs> they were really cool and really welcoming and just made it a seamless transition. And we got to play table tennis at lunch. Yeah, I, w I wish I'd practiced that before I joined the team because 
Editing is quite lonely because you're sort of more or less on your own for quite a lot of the time. So working with other editors who are next door to you and you can easily sort of pop into their room or they can come to yours and chat about scenes or mm. what's working or what's not is, is really helpful. Yeah, we did have an unusual situation where we formed a kind of COVID bubble for want of a better turn of phrase and we were on a floor of the offices and it was just the sex ed team mm. and... It was kind of, was it which, I can't even remember which lockdown it was, but we were in a lockdown of sorts and it was just uh, us in Soho cutting away and it was great. And what I think is a bit frustrating for Steve and I in a way is the guys come on and we, we're very proud of the show and we think in our moments of hubris that it's down to us and we're so amazing. And then some other dudes come on and they do exactly the same show to exactly the same level and it feels like the same show and it's like, oh. We ain't special. <laughs> we ain't special at all. And it's a real achievement to slip into something that's got an established style and step up. And But that's the style that you set. And that's, you know, well, I don't know. This is how I feel. I'm sure Phil feels the same. That's why I was so attracted to it. That kind of, like you were saying earlier, Steve, that music video, it has a different feel to so much other stuff on TV. It has an energy that some stuff lacks, I would say. So the first series was released, uh, first season, I should say, was released January 2019, second January 2020, then the third September 2021. So that seems like a pretty aggressive schedule for a show that has eight roughly hour-long episodes. And since it's Netflix, they have to be delivered all at once. Can any of you walk me through the basic timeline of a single episode from the time you see the script to when you hand off to the online editor? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> uh, our experience in this is going to be very different because the other editors are going to say, I don't even read the script when I'm editing it because um, they're particularly mean about me. But um, Steve, why don't you <laughs> take this one? Well, weirdly, it feels because of the number of us that it isn't that rushed. They always seem to give us enough time to edit compared to a lot of other shows that I've edited. It's good. It's what you need in order to be creative. So, yeah. We get the scripts and they do this amazing thing that even if some other episode is being shot that you're not cutting, you still have that time to be cutting. There's four of us on the show. They stagger it a bit. Like Izzy didn't come in until later down the line. She had one show to do. So they're not going to hire her for the whole shoot. No. And Rob assembled my scenes. Yeah. But for us guys who were kind of on at the beginning when we had more than one episode to, to cut, there was ample time because we were around for not all of the shoot, but most of it and you know you're used to cutting a full day's worth of footage every day as an editor you know that's that's the process five to eight minutes probably on average and then the way that Ben works is he won't watch assemblies anyway unless you really really shout and flag something you know if something's technical issue that's the scary thing about Ben not watching them you have to be so confident in the fact that something wrong to like stick your head above the parapet and say hold on guys I'm calling the shoot you've got to fix something here it's not working and that probably happens once or twice during the shoot for each editor I'd, I'd say and you've got to be so certain to call it because then it all kicks into action and people really pay attention to the assemblies and um, and then usually tell us I oh, know it's fine we can fix it. I think the reason why Ben doesn't watch the assemblies is firstly you hope that he has confidence in his editors which I think he does but also I think it's incredibly difficult for a director to concentrate on their day-to-day -day and focus on their work if they're thinking of what they've just shot as well I mean their schedules are you know the amount that they've got to do in a day and concentrate on is enough but what happens is by the time that our directors hit our edit once the shoot is finished we've pretty much got episodes assembled more than roughly but, you know, still completely open to all, but, you know, you get a real sense of an episode by the time that they hit the, the, the room. There's already music on it. It's already all put together. And then we spend the next, what do we get, about five weeks per app? I guess so, yeah. Four or five weeks. Really honing it and just making it really sick. So hopefully, then, you know, that comes across in it. But, yeah, I don't think any of us feel particularly pressured by the edit. But weirdly, on season one, the process was slightly different because we both know Ben from old. As Steve was saying, Ben came in and kind of pitched the concept to us, which was a bit difficult to wrap our heads around, having never... You know, he came in and he played the Ezra track to us, didn't he? Was, um, what's the Ezra track, Steve? Why am I forgetting it? 
Come on, Phil. You're a uh, what from series one? Yeah, series one. I didn't watch series one. <laughs> oh my god, what's it called? Uh, Love you so bad. Is it Love You So Bad? Yeah, anyway, so he came in and played Ezra's Love You So Bad and pitched the whole show on the basis of one track, which kind of gave us a vibe. And then it was a way, quite a way before he went off to shoot. And I think I was in Madrid cutting another project for Netflix. Of course you were, mate. Of course I was, yeah. And um, we spent quite a long time listening to music before we even did the show. So we had like playlists of hundreds of tracks based on that Ben's original pitch. And it was completely misguided, by the way. Most of them went in the bin because it was all completely 80s. We had this concept that it was a completely 80s-themed kind of show, which clearly it isn't because it's way more eclectic than that. You know, David, you mentioned being in the pandemic bubble together in Soho. As we said, the third season was delayed eight months. Were you just not working during that time or were you working through part of it? And how did it impact the production and post-workflow? Other than you just being together as part of a COVID bubble, what was the impact of the uh, pandemic on production and post? I mean, it delayed the scheduled start of the production. I think that's essentially what happened to Sex Ed. So it, I think it was six months late starting, and then it was quite a protracted production schedule. And I think they got away pretty well in terms of COVID cases on the shoot. It was pretty buttoned down, so I don't think they suffered too much. It's just shooting hours were reduced because of the precautions that were you know, needed to be done to ensure a safe environment. So... It was a longer than normal production process. But I came on board in August, I think, and was assembling some of the other editors' scenes, which was a mixed bag of delights for um, both sides of that arrangement. Uh, (laughs) So just to say, Dave is a brilliant assembly editor. (laughs) (laughs) He's probably the best, actually. Best in the business. I've always said that. He's a really brilliant... When people say, what's Dave like as an editor? I say, he's a brilliant assembly editor (laughs) what it showed us i think is that we all have such different initial instinct that it's so hard to assemble someone else's scenes phil's much more gracious about it but i've known steve for a lot longer so he's much more of a dick about my assemblies (laughs) There there are some scenes dave that you assembled that i think i touched like one shot or like a few frames and i will go a step further and say dave's a great assembly editor but also a great editor. (laughs) (laughs) I completely agree. The thing is, I was on another job by the time Sex Ed hit. I was finishing off Frank of Ireland. There was two months overlap. So I could be on board early enough to do my own assemblies. Dave was on board, did the assemblies, all very cool. It's my only insecurities that I I have to do my own assemblies. I suppose it's just that fact that I, I don't believe you could cut a scene without having seen all the footage anyway. So I will always, you know, it was, it's great. You watch someone's assembly and go, okay, but then I still have to go back personally and watch every single take yeah. and recut it the way that I would do it. And you, and, and, and actually the, be- the best way for me to do it is if I've got the time, do it from scratch. If not, I would have taken Dave's assemblies and spent half the time doing it and still have probably got to the same place. But if you've got the option just for your own kind of sensibilities and to know that you've got what you want from it you have to go back and watch everything anyway yeah. it helps further down the line as well doesn't it because you know everything yeah you've got the exact notes you know what you've got sorry did we even answer your question i can't remember what your question was about what was i can't either so we better move on to another one <laughs> the show has four editors but as far as i can tell one first assistant rob frost mm-hmm. so how does it work that one assistant editor one first assistant is supporting you four editors at the same time he has a second with him he had no. a <laughs> the better answer is he's he's very good at his job he is oh yeah that's the better answer i mean <laughs> he had help <laughs> so we're so used to having rob around stuff just gets done And to such a professional level, you just don't even notice it, which is the dream of having a consummately professional assistant. And he's now um, stepping up to edit some of the show I'm on currently. We're both editing scenes simultaneously because I'm trying to mentor him, And although God knows how that's going to work out. But what we're doing is where there's scenes on an episode that he's cutting, we're both cutting them and then watching them together, cherry picking the best bits, and then I'm saying it's all my work which is the dream. He's brilliant, Rob. He's been brilliant from the day he started with us. He 
puts in shade any of the assistance we've had before. And he's able to, to do the workload. And it's a shame, really, because he's not going to be an assistant for long. So yeah, it's a, it's a real mixed bag about how you approach it. Do you praise him too much or do you try and keep him working for you? Mm. You just try and undermine him slightly, just enough to keep him in a system for a while. He's not long for the assistant world because um, he's going to step up. You know, an assistant's job can vary depending on the show, depending on the mm-hmm. editor. In general, what are the things that he's doing to support the four of you? There's such a volume of stuff on sex ed that it really is more basic, functional assistant work. Although I say that, he's particularly good at VFX and mm. he's great at doing temp VFX and graphics. So if there's anything like that, as old dinosaurs, that's me and Steve, chuck him some notes and he gets to do it on After Effects for us. That, he's brilliant at that stuff. Yeah, it's amazing that he's just, you, you give him something and he'll animate stuff and give you it back within the hour and then it's something in your edit and it's just a great place to be and something that we didn't expect assistants to be doing for us. So there may not have always been overlap, but was it possible for the four of you, since you had your COVID bubble working, to meet on a somewhat regular basis and discuss how the show is progressing or to take a look at each other's cuts to offer suggestions? Oh, yeah. All the time. And what's weird is we watch each other's stuff and then we comment and we bristle and we're like, oh, God, how dare we say that? And then it sinks in and you're like, oh, fuck it, they're right. And then you kind of do it whilst they're not looking and pretend it's yours. But it's kind of like collaborative and attritional and it works for us. We, we, we genuinely, I think, do tend, we do improve each other's work. I always enjoyed when Ben got us in to watch the cuts with different tracks on towards the end when you guys were changing tracks for one reason or another and therefore got in the room together, listened to the tracks, both for their favourite one. Yeah, Dave has um, a sort of a technique, I guess you'd call it, of just putting the same scene down on one timeline and just putting like 20 tracks up against it and just getting a, a feel for it. And it's kind of a, I guess something, I mean, Dave, you can probably speak to this, but is that like a commercial thing where you sort of trying out the same picture with just different music? I think so. I think there's this horrible thing in commercials where um, you keep trying needle drops kind of like forever because there's always something potentially better out there. And Would you say that your music auditions were longer than the episode? <laughs> Some of them were. I think Hope's Dance, for instance. Yeah. She, she, she danced to like all sorts of stuff coming on. And what's weird is in those scenes is often what they shoot to is something that we've arrived on in an earlier pitching session and then they'll shoot a scene to a needle drop and then for whatever reason it gets blown out of the water whether that's for licensing reasons or often an estate someone in the estate of a deceased artist will say no we're not going to approve that because it's sex ed and then we have to go to this process of pitching new tracks and I think from working in commercials it's taught you that you shouldn't always stay in the same genre you should absolutely flip it on its head and that's what we try to do we try to try new things, but I don't know, we always try to be a bit esoteric and try and think of something left field, you know, when we're doing these things. Coming back to table tennis for a second. Yeah. So we can have the table tennis in the, in the sort of the reception area. This is my memory of it. We would play table tennis and talk about the show. We would make coffee and, and drink coffee and talk about the show. It was sort of, that was, it kind of felt like a little family when we were sort of doing that. That's sort of my, I guess, overarching memory for sort of the collaboration side of things. You spent a lot of time playing table tennis. That's my memory of it. <laughs> I mean, you remember these great times about how half your day was a table tennis match with Dave. It was. It wasn't my day. You remember on season three, we all sat down and watched season two, which is a pretty weird, <laughs> narcissistic thing to do. But we sat in reception watching the last season. I've got photos of that, yeah. <laughs> Well, how did that help you going into season three? Did watching season two together, that must have helped. Hell yeah. Hello. <laughs> Take a call. That's Dave's phone voice. Brilliant. I'm, just, I'm on a podcast recording. And so I'll pull that now. So I'll just pull the oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry about that. What, did you just diss me? <laughs> no, 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 never. Anyway. So your fame, as I have mentioned before, has preceded you. I've had people write in and ask, can you get the sex ed team on to talk about the show, which has finally happened. 
And one such big fan, Nicoletta, actually gave me some questions to ask you, which is great because it means I get to sort of take the day off. So here we go with question number one. This Anybody can take this. Uh, you know, with several different storylines in each episode, how did you go about making us feel so invested in short sections of time each story had? Further to that, since some stories are lighter and some more serious, how did you achieve making such smooth transitions between these little storylines? Yeah. Wow, great question. Someone else has to answer that. <laughs> we sometimes liken this to, I know I've talked about this old boy band videos, but back in the 90s when we did boy band videos and there was like five members of the boy band and you'd always have to keep checking in with each singer or just the guy that just danced around. That's uh, in a much, that's a terrible <laughs> analogy. Yeah. In a much longer form, that's sex ed. You just have to keep checking in with everybody and it's an absolute nightmare. Yeah. And also we get to the end of an episode when we've assembled it and it's 72 minutes long because everyone's being serviced to the nth degree, you know, kind of everyone's storyline is there and present. And then we sit and we scratch our heads and we're like, well, whose storyline doesn't need to work so hard in this episode? Sometimes in like season two, I think we started stories of the week and then we didn't even finish them, even though they'd been written and shot because there were so many kind of lines of narrative to service that we just couldn't fit them in the timeline, really. I think Ollie's music as well does does a lot of the heavy lifting in that department. For me, like his cues from series one and series two, we could use it as temp for, for series three. And he would obviously sort of, yeah, create new ones. And they would do, for me anyway, a lot of the heavy lifting to, to have that tonal shift and that tonal change from the serious and the sort of the dramatic to the light and comedy stuff. To some extent, a lot of it's there in the writing anyway and the, and the way it's written. It's got the right weight about when you're feeling like you, you've had enough of serious, let's go funny. But also nobody, whether it be Laurie or Ben or Ron Uraro or any of us, is scared about looking at the whole piece of working out what can go and what can stay. Mm. It's not a, a fixed template. You know, It's not treated as it has to be exactly what was on the page. And everything gets analyzed it's true and then you find that something gets reduced or some things get extended and uh, you find a happy place and often we'd audition cuts which had lost like 10 minutes of storylines and show them to the execs and say look this is if we really want to bring things down we can do this and then not horse trading but then we'd consider well what can we put back in to keep the balance right but i think in terms of tonally i think there was a consideration early on to just always invest gravity to the emotional scenes not to underplay them because it's a comedy but to go with the seriousness of the scenes and just conflate those with the comic scenes which are utterly ridiculous in places but just kind of don't try and conceal the intent of either you know go maximum comedy and go maximum portent or emotion on the on the serious scenes it isn't actually that much of a mental process that we go through in order to get that balance to happen it's just it works and people respond to it well, on a related note, uh, I think I read that Laurie Nunn, the series creator, said something about, I don't want this to be all about the teenagers, and I don't want to treat the adults as some sort of obstacle that teenagers have to get around. I want them to play an equal role in this as well. I think that was uh, one of the things that just came about during the process of watching the reactions to season one and season two, mm. that everyone seems to be as invested in Gene and Jacob and Mr. Groff and all the adult characters. Who's Jacob? Yakob. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. Smoothie. <laughs> Smoothie. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I think probably Laurie realized that, you know, she can go ahead and write for them and they're not going to be scenes that are either going to be chopped or not as important as the rest. I mean, Gillian uh, Anderson is just a, a revelation in the role of G. Mm. She's so good on screen. And I think there was new territory for her in the first season you know no one really knew how it's going to go down and it went down really well i think it's all about just the response from the fans has been yeah we're totally into everyone i think the most confident though were netflix about how it was going to go down that was the unusual thing because we all kind of uh, conspired to make this thing you know with ben leading the <laughs> leading us along and we just didn't know what the heck it was or how it was going to be perceived I think some of the British press was a bit sniffy as well when it first went out, as in not particularly um, complimentary about, about it, saying some of it was puerile and infantile. And um, I guess they didn't quite see how it would engage with a generation of kids. And beyond that kind of 
engage with their parents. That's what was the surprise for me. Yeah, there's many, many 35 to 45 year olds that watch this, kids as far as I'm concerned. My parents watch it and they love it. And they're older than 35. <laughs> 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 so phil spotlights on you you ready ready this is a little segment that i'm dusting off called defending your edit you've seen defending your life oh boy and nicoletta asks uh in episode four of season three i'm pretty sure this is you mm -hmm. there's an intimate moment between isaac and mave that has a very unique cutting style yes yes it does that is you yep okay we're off to a good start <laughs> you actually did cut that it's shot handheld and in close-up. There's jump cuts, split edits for the audio. So what was your inspiration for that scene? Um, great question, Nicoletta. So, yeah, that scene was tough, actually. That was really tough. It was sort of not traditionally covered. Every sort of quote-unquote sex scene is, is quite sort of different. And this was sort of a tricky one to do, very sensitive, I guess. So not traditionally covered, but we had just the one camera really just sort of in their faces and, and just sort of trying to get as much emotion from them as possible. And I was at a loss for a really long time as to, as to what to do and, and how to do it. So because it wasn't covered traditionally, I didn't cut it traditionally. But the way it ended up was because of, uh, I don't know if you've seen Out of Sight, there's like a really amazing scene with Jennifer Lopez and, and George Clooney where they sort of talk in a bar and then they sort of flash forward to them getting intimate in the bedroom and there's a lot of pre-lapping and overlapping and that was my inspiration for that sort of bringing in dialogue from the next cut earlier to sort of help smooth that transition of essentially just jump cutting so yeah it was a tricky one and it didn't work for the longest time but then when it worked it worked and also we tamped it with a john bryan track which always helps and that combined with the style from out of sight made it work. In the time that you've spent together, are there techniques or practices that you've been able to pick up from one another in terms of like, wow, I see that Dave does this or Steve does that or Izzy does this. I should be doing that. I have to say, I hadn't seen all of Izzy's app fully through until it hit the air. And I, I watched it and I, I thought it was brilliant. And it made me think I sometimes need to slow down a little bit because there's a lot of emotion in a lot of your scenes, is it? That's there in the in the shots and the way you cut it. I was uh, quite impressed. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to respond to that. <laughs> I'll add to that. I really enjoyed it as well, Izzy. I really enjoyed the nightclub stuff. I thought it was really sensitively done and really felt it. I got all the feels from that scene. Oh, good. Well, I feel like with F six, they shot the Nigerian stuff right at the end, so. I was a bit worried when I was doing the assemblies because all the stuff, I feel like the kind of life of the episode, that episode really lives in Nigeria and the kind of fun side of it's in Nigeria where lots of the stuff in Mordell is quite, how it's written, it's more emotional. So I was cutting it thinking, oh my gosh, am I managing to make sex ed depressing? <laughs> when I was watching all your episodes and all these fun set pieces and comic moments and but then once Nigeria came in, there was more of that and we worked on it. So, yeah, I was thinking the other way around. <laughs> There's lots of laughs in Six as well. Yeah. I felt like a lot of the outs of your scene found that comedy moments where you stuck around for the comedy mm. rather than getting out as quick as possible to move on to the next thing. Mm. Rather than just landing on a comedy goat head turn like you and me, Steve. I just do door slaps. <laughs> Would someone please shut a door so I can get out of this scene? <laughs> and would please somebody open a door so I can get into the next scene? <laughs> Do you each have a favorite type of scene to work on or favorite character even to be focusing on? I love Eric. Eric's the best. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I loved when I read episode six, because it's kind of mainly Eric. But yeah, they're all great. Amy's hilarious. But I'm kind of speaking from a fan point of view from watching the first two seasons. So when I came onto it, getting to see the rushes of these characters that I've already kind of fallen in love with was awesome. A good a cappella scene with Jim Howick in was always fun. <laughs> he puts something else into all of his scenes. He's an amazing comic actor, so I'm always happy to cut a scene with him. The cast is so good. There's such mm -hmm. I love a scene with Adam. I just I think he's so good. You can really, you watch the way Connor thinks about acting and you can just 
watch his face for quite a long time constructing these thoughts and it's always interesting it's very subtle yeah we all kind of like blends it and eric is always so much energy and everything Chuty does and not a bad bunch to get you know difficult to say what your favorites are so as you said you looked at it from a fan's perspective we went through nicoletta's questions what do fans of the show whether they're in the field of post-production or not ask you most often what's going to happen no one wants spoilers no one ever asked that no, nobody wants to know. No. Are you kidding? That's all I get is what's going to happen with this person? What's going to happen with that character? Really? My wife, she refuses to have conversations with me about the job. She says, I just want to see it when it's on air. I don't want you to tell me anything. I don't want you to spoil what's going to happen. She's a big fan. So also she's tired of listening to me. We all watch it as punters, though, don't we, when it comes on? Mm. So we kind of text each other when we're watching it if there's something particularly emotive or funny. Do you know going into the season how the show is going to go for the duration of the season? Typically, we, we do know the arc, and Ben's great at kind of guiding that process because um, if you're just working in isolation, your temptation is to banjax a scene which is um, particularly important for the next episode or two episodes down, down the line. But, you know, since we do sit in and watch each other's stuff, it kind of helps uh, inform that process. Absolutely. And that's kind of back to that um, question before about lots of different characters and checking in. Yeah. Because we found that with episode six, what could we, who could we afford to lose if they were going to be in the next episode or the one before, you know, so it's quite important. We had one particularly um, spicy conversation with Steve, me and Ben, where um, we were trying to, <laughs> trying to exit all of Mr. Groff's scene from one of my episodes and give them to Steve, which Steve wasn't happy about. <laughs> Why you weren't happy about having those scenes, Steve? I don't know. But... I think it was all a test of my... <laughs> well, not a test of me. It was just to push my butt. Test of your flexibility. They walked in and basically said, our, our, our episode's a bit long. Would you like 24 <laughs> minutes of Mr. Groff's scene? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I asked you about uh, you know, what your favourite scenes were to do. I think the next place to go really logically is for each of you, what character were you most like when you were that age and why? Wow, what a question. Mind blown. <laughs> I think we should go in age order, Dave. Oh, so reverse age order, so I'll go first then. Um, <laughs> so season one, Otis, completely inept in every single way is how I would uh, identify. But I suppose everyone was pretty much at the start of season one. So it's so relatable. Hold on, but that puts me wanking in toilets at school, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I definitely don't relate to the untouchables. I'm way more kind of a, probably an Otis with a bit of Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. God. <laughs> I played a lot of sport growing up, so I'm going to be in the Jackson camp, except oh, I'm way yeah. less <laughs> cool. Way less cool. Just the sport aspect. I can't think of a, a, a proper answer. That's a, a really good question. You're kind of a cross between Jackson and Maury, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> Maury. Yeah, short answer, yes. You love a mango. Who doesn't? <laughs> Is he? God, it's so hard. I feel like, yeah, I was definitely awkward like Otis, just struggling to navigate teenage life. I think that's why he's so relatable. I feel like loads of people were like that. Well, can I ask a question of you, Matt? Who who were you most like? Uh, I don't think he appeared in the show, but the janitor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming the school has a janitor. Did we have a janitor? No, we never did. <laughs> Maybe in season four. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Thanks to the crew from Sex Ed for taking a little time away from the teacher's lounge to visit with us. And extra special thanks to Nicoletta for lending me a hand with today's podcast. I hope you all had fun and learned a thing or two. I know I always do. You can have fun and learn lots of things when you get your hands on Avid Media Composer Ultimate. It's appropriate for all age groups and more affordable than ever. Seriously, you might be surprised. But if you want to try before you buy or subscribe, Avid can help you with that too. Just download your free 30-day trial to Avid Media Composer Ultimate. There's a little link in the show notes just for you. Don't share with anyone else. I put it there just for you. Okay, you can share the link. And please share the podcast too. Who knows, maybe together we can grow our global classroom of post-production fans. We've been doing remote learning here on the podcast from day one. It seems to be working okay. Speaking of working, I have to get back to doing some. You probably do too. So until next time, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Would someone please shut a door so I can get out of this seat? <laughs> <laughs>